This is Oscar Michaels reporting live with the LARP News Network. All hell has broken loose on the front lines. As you can see, we have Israeli special operators joined by foreign forces. There have been incoming sectors of fire everywhere. Even I have been caught in the crossfire. Oh, bollocks! This might be our time, fellas! Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So this episode is a very interesting episode because of the political climate right now. At the time of this recording, um, the IDF has just launched their second phase of the war, their ground invasion into Gaza, not the first time they've been in Gaza, uh, of the latest Hamas-Israel war. And this is definitely going to be one of those wars that's potentially going to change the Middle East forever. Uh, but of course, one of the weapons that the IDF is using is the X-95. And of course, its predecessor, you know, can't talk about the X-95 without mentioning the Tavor Sar. Um, but before we get into the gear and everything else, just want to thank a couple people for supporting the channel because uh, they help make the set how awesome it is. Like save your equipment for the for the gun walls, for the gear stands and such forth, and cool gun bags. Check those guys out. Uh, if you're into shooting, going to the range, and you know, I like shooting at trash, but I'm not a big fan of littering. So check out Infinity Defense. They make a reusable self-healing target that you can just paint over and shoot dozens and dozens of times. They probably could put a couple hundred, if not a couple thousand rounds through a couple of the targets that I currently have. Um, I've got a discount code in the description below if you want to check those out and support the channel. Last but not least, we also have True Shot Ammo. Now, the biggest thing about going to the range, as you know, is just ammo ain't cheap. And without guys like True Shot, we couldn't make the content that we're making right now. So be sure to check those guys out. Um, they've got a little bit of everything, handgun, rifle, AK, 5.56, you know, all kinds of cool ammo, depending on what your ammo needs are. Check those guys out. Now, for the gear and the rifles that you're going to be seeing in this video, the rifles were provided by IWI, also known as Israeli Weapons Industries, um, both the Tavorsar and the X-95. So thank you guys for supporting us with those. And of course, the gear, it's a mix between gear from Agilite, which is another Israeli defense company, and Haley Strategic. Currently, right now, there's even, like, the marketing team, like the full like team over at Agilite is working to support the conflict. And a lot of their designers, a lot of their staff are actually called back up into the IDF right now. So very, very interesting world right now where you're seeing guys who are making the gear, wearing it in theater, fighting for their country. So it's a very interesting situation, but a lot of love for those guys, for the support they've given me all, all throughout the years, especially in the helmet covers for MTech. But let's go over the guns. So... I have, of course, X95 and a Tavor SAR. Now, kind of jumping back in time, kind of want to talk about the Tavor SAR a little bit. Shabbat Shalom.
This is the gun that most people are probably familiar with because it's just iconic. Whether you've seen Future Weapons or played Call of Duty or played any kind of war game or Project Reality or something like that, you've probably come across the Tavor. It's one of the more modern bullpups to be um, you know, released to the world, if you will. Um, coming out, releasing in like the early 2000s, the Tavor was basically their 21st century bullpup rifle is basically more or less what it was. This is not the IDF version exactly. The IDF version has a different rail system, has an 18-inch barrel, uh, but of course they made multiple different barrel lanes and different configurations, some that could accept grenade launchers as well. Um, the Tavor SAR, this specific one, was the commercial version, which IWI very based allowing their weapons to be sold in the United States to responsible armed citizens and patriots. So very cool that they've made those weapons uh, accessible to the American citizen. Um, this is the more commercial version that has the full length rail, but I may change some stuff around, either make it more like the IDF version or maybe modernize it a little bit. As you can see, it has uh, cutie points right here and right here. So, and it well, looks like there's one up here too. I think that's a third one up there, I'm not 100% sure. but. Um, Definitely you'll notice that there's a lot of features that are upgraded or changed on the X95. One thing you'll immediately notice is the weapon's very heavy to the rear because it's a bolt configuration. The action uh, is all here, the bolts of the full firing mechanism and whatnot. But even then, it's still it's still a little heavy, heavy on the heavy side. Not as heavy as like an MDR, but you know, you could still do a pretty good job, you know, holding the weapon and you know keeping the weapon up and you know, if you really need to use a hand for something else, you can kind of tuck the weapon in and it kind of becomes like a large pistol. Um, but in terms of controls, the Tavor SAR is interesting because they did mimic some of the AR-15 fire controls a little bit. So coming over from air, air platform to the Tavor SAR is not as big of a jump as you'd think. And I kind of go over that a little bit more when I head to the range of the X-95. Um, charging handle is a in a different position, uh, it's further up on the Tavor SAR, as you can see. And you know, I didn't really have the time to kind of wire the Mars uh, switch into the grip. You can absolutely do that, but I believe you need to like disassemble a bunch of stuff to wire it through. And I just didn't have the time, didn't want to deal with the trouble. And my first attempt didn't really go very well. Also, you'll see it has a cutlass style grip, which the X95 also has. I'm not a huge fan of this just because it's very easy to get your finger into where the trigger is. So I kind of wish I had a traditional trigger guard, but you know, we're kind of sticking with tradition here. So this is what you got. Now, what's interesting is that the mag release is also different from the X95. The original mag magazine release basically has like a lever back here that actuates the magazine. So when you lock the bolt to the rear, um, you strip the magazine out, you put a new magazine in, hit this bolt catch, which is right here. I'll show you guys again. You basically strip the magazine, insert, hit the bolt catch right here, which you can also use to lock the bolt to the rear as well. Uh, and that sends the bolt forward. Now there's a tip where you basically use the back part of your hand, like so, by pressing back like this, and you can actually drop the magazine. And it's kind of like a trick speed reload method that um, you know, you'll see like a bunch of guys, like Travis Haley and a couple other guys have you talked about using that technique with this rifle. Of course, once you get to the X95, you don't even have to worry about that anymore. Um, one thing that's also really cool is I actually managed to track down not one, but two of these ITL Mars optics. They made a couple different versions, IR and visible laser versions. I have two of the IR versions, which were a little bit harder to find. It's not the best optic, but it laid the groundwork for what is eventually would be like the Meprolite MOR. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's what the current issue is on the current rifles today. But the Mars has definitely got that classic silhouette. It almost makes the gun kind of look like a tuna fish, if you will. Um, and I also think it's really cool the laser and the optic are co-witnessed. And what was funny is that when I went on YouTube, I was actually kind of surprised how little content and information there was about this like of course there's tons of information on the forums but just on youtube there just didn't seem to be very many people with these um showing them off and the functionality now what's cool is it has a switch on this side it's just really rudimentary um this is the standard picatinny version i think there's a slightly different mount or maybe something similar for the idf version but um this is actually the kind of mount that you could actually put on like an m16 there's actually pictures of marines running ITL Mars on their guns, but of course that was very short-lived. Um, basically you, you have an off switch and then when you're down, you're on full brightness 
uh, and then when you go down a couple more the brightness gets lower and lower and technically it's kind of more somewhere around depending on lighting conditions around the last couple settings is like your night vision setting if you're using passive aiming with the mars and it also has kind of like a little reference point dot uh, or reference point like kind of nipple on top of for your like iron sight backup if you will um what's cool like i mentioned earlier it's co-witnessed with the laser so when this dot is on like when you when you switch this sucker on if you press this button the laser will go on now you can't see the laser here but i'll show night vision footage of me testing it out because that was one of the things i was most curious about was like how does it work and it actually is very cool to have a weapon with an optic and a co-witness laser in a package that small as early as the early 2000s. Really, really cool. I know EOTech uh, made an optic that attempted something very similar, uh, but this is definitely, in my opinion, of that type of optic, a hybrid optic, if you will, with the laser, very, very iconic. Uh, it just, it's just so cool. I mean, like I said, it's not the best optic, but it is badass. It just looks great. Um, and of course, um, the gun itself, how does it shoot? Well, um, I've noticed both with the X95 and the Tavor kind of coming from an Air 15 platform, you know, everyone says stuff about the trigger. Now, the trigger is not that great. <laughs> the X95 is actually significantly better, uh, but and you can even take it a step further by going with like a Geisley trigger or something like that, or for the Tavor, uh, Tavor SAR and the X95, if you really want to push it to its limit and really get it much closer to what something would feel like on like an, an, a really well done Air 15 or something like that, or even with like something with like an ALG defense trigger or something like that. Um, trigger's not the best. And one thing I noticed is that the gun is very jumpy. Um, you know, with an Air 15, I can get those to shoot pretty flat. But with standard birdcage and just standard configuration, I did notice the gun was just a little bit more jumpy than when I shoot like a Daniel Defense or a BCM or whatnot. Maybe it could be my recoil management on this. Um, and thankfully it doesn't have a reciprocating charging handle. So you can, you can get a pretty good grip on this gun. Uh, but I think, you know, obviously going with like a railed handguard definitely helped, uh, especially with the X95. So that's kind of the Tavor SAR in a nutshell. And of course, uh, if you own one of these guns, I definitely think you need to get the IWI tool for disassembling and maintenance and stuff like that. Just good to have. Um, but I mean, it's a fairly accurate gun sands the trigger you know you can have an accurate barrel 16 18 inch barrel in, in a nice compact package which is great for cqb but the trigger is definitely going to play into that accuracy at distance so if you really want to squeeze the most out of your Tavor SAR or your X95, definitely get the upgraded trigger. And as you can see like the whole lower and everything is just all integrated is kind of a baked in option but with the X95 that's where things really get interesting. All right, so now that we've gotten some of the history out of the way, my relationship with IWI and a couple other things, let's talk about what you all came here to see, the X95. Of course, I was shooting the Tavor SAR earlier. This is actually, a, in my opinion, probably one of my favorite bullpups that I've ever messed around with. But specifically, I kind of want to go over some of the features and the manipulation. Now, being a very heavily an AR shooter, coming to this was actually not that hard because they changed a lot of things from the Tavor to the X95. Mainly the controls, manual of arms, still a little different with the manual of arms, specifically with malfunctions and whatnot. But what I love about it is selectors basically in relatively the same spot. The trigger is massively, in my opinion, improved over the Tavor SAR. You can still upgrade it with like a Geisley trigger or something like that. Um, so there's better options out there, but considering it is a bullpup, Trigger is actually very nice, um, very crispy. Um, the mag release is probably one of the biggest improvements because they basically just put it right where it would be on an AR-15. So dropping the mag is extremely efficient and actually increases the efficiency of your reloads and whatnot. So I definitely dig that. Um, you're not having to basically do a modified like press of like a lever or anything back here to drop the mag. Um, so that just helps all around. Um, if you're not familiar with the charging handle, it's identical to the Tavor SAR. What I like about it, um, it's actually curved to the front, so really, when you grab it, you're really catching it. It doesn't just stick out directly to the side like a scar. 
Also, it basically captures itself to the front. So, and you can use it as like a forward assist if something gets stuck or whatnot. But even if you don't have it locked all the way to the front, when you shoot it, it'll get locked back into place. It's non-reciprocating, so you're not gonna have this thing moving in your face if you're a right-hand shooter. And well, if you're a left-hand shooter, you got other problems. Um, one thing also too, feature-wise, the handguard, initially, as you can see on this side, um, I've got the standard rail cover on here. I was kind of a dummy because I didn't even realize that there was Picatinny under there because I was trying to figure out, I was like, how's everyone getting these Picatinny rails on their X95? And lo and behold, it comes with them. It just got these very seamless, beautiful looking handguards on there. And I, I just didn't realize like, oh, you just take those off and there's your Picatinny rails. Now they're a little bit more aggressive because of how they're cut. So if you have something like Ergo or Magpul ladder rails, that's probably something I would suggest if you plan on sticking with the OEM rail. There's a lot of other great manufacturers like RPM Tool, uh, Manticore, and a bunch of other companies that make hand guards and other accessories for the front end. But I'd say for the most part, unless you want to go like M-Lock or something like that, um, this is actually a pretty utilitarian way of keeping and running the gun if you want to stick to a more OEM tried and true configuration. And of course, I got my BCM grip up here in the reverse position so that way I can have a good grip on the gun and I've got my light up here. For right now, I just have it with the uh, button tail cap so I can just press like this and activate the light. Um, but pretty standard setup. Uh, I have an EOTech on here, but I do think if you want to run a riser on here, it would actually probably work pretty well. Um, just because of the way, like how the stock is completely in line with the whole rail system up here. Um, you know, even with an AR-15, there's like a slight little dip or drop with like the buffer tube um, because it's like almost virtually perfectly in line. Even with this, it kind of seems a little bit low. So if you want that natural head position or whatnot, something like an EOTech XPS or EXPS on a Unity Fast Riser would probably be pretty good for this gun. But of course, even with something like this, you can still do plenty of work all day with your standard height optics. Um, also, the weight's all in the rear. Um, so it's actually pretty maneuverable, especially when you kind of break the weapon down. Of course, the 16 inch length barrel is gonna give you great velocity. Uh, but it also, because it's a bullpup, it allows you to really squeeze into tight spaces really well. Um, but yeah, even though the weight is pretty heavy back here, it'll allow you to hold the gun like this for a little bit longer. It's still kind of a heavy gun, but it's not the heaviest bullpup out there. Like the Desert Tech MDR is like straight up like a boat anchor compared to this thing. So I think they did a pretty good job of balancing the weapon. Of course, again, a lot of similarities with, the, with its predecessors, the IDF version and Tavor Sar. Uh, but I think a lot of the manual of arms and things that they've done have massively improved it. Now, here's where it gets tricky. When it comes to malfunctions on an AR-15, it's pretty easy to address. With this one, you basically have to pull the magazine release back, reach back, find this little tiny pull tab, and then pull that out. That's your bolt release right there. And then you can get to work fixing the malfunctions. But, you know, this is the very small thing that you have to grab, and it's all the way back here. So it makes for faster reloading, but when it comes to troubleshooting issues with the gun, with thankfully I haven't really had much of any, um, makes it a little bit trickier. So run good quality ammo, and more than likely you probably won't have those issues, but just know that if you need to lock the magazine to the rear and manually lock it like that, a little bit extra work, unless obviously, unless you have like an empty mag in the gun or whatnot. But um, yeah, when dealing with malfunctions, just a little bit extra stuff you gotta do. Um, but yeah, it's pretty simple straight out of the box. Um, the other thing that I would probably change is the, the grip. So it comes with a cutlass grip. Um, the IDF actually uses one that has like an actual um, trigger guard right here, which I kind of prefer because my hands are kind of small and they kind of tend to slip a little bit. So not a big fan of the cutlass style grip. Um, it's more of a traditional thing with the Tavor Sar and the other ones, but on the X95, I kind of would prefer something like more like what the IDF runs on theirs, which they have the trigger guard. Plus, there's an okay amount of aftermarket options. Nothing crazy like you would look in the world of AR-15s, but if you want a more traditional AR style, you know, you know, pistol grip on the X95, that option is available. You just kind of go find it. But um, yeah, overall though, I found, I think with this gun, I can probably get close to the speed of at least reloading with an AR-15 which I actually find very surprising. And for me, that kind of makes it a lot of fun to shoot this gun. But uh, that's kind of the manipulations and some of the basic rundown in a nutshell. Uh, but yeah, it's a very fun gun in terms of shooting it. So let's go shoot some more. 
All right, guys, so I'm here at the range just getting some trigger time with the X95. Uh, we're going to run Mike's favorite drill, the bill drill. Uh, I actually don't run it as much as I should, and I'm actually very excited to be doing a couple of them with this gun here. Uh, the gun's definitely a little bit jumpier than, like, my typical AR-15. That's one thing I've noticed. Um, but other than that, still a lot of fun to shoot it. Also going to be using the new shot timer from Shooters Global. Works with suppressors, airsoft, dry fire. Very functional gun, but um, without further ado, let's give it a shot. That one actually went okay. Um, there's a couple shots earlier from like when I shot the target earlier, but especially at this distance, you gotta take into account height over bore. So I primarily aimed right up here and most of my shots went here. My first group when I did it a little bit earlier, I was just totally not even thinking about height over bore and that's why you got a little group down here, but not bad. So check out also Infinity Targets. They make these awesome rubber targets that you can just shoot over and over and over and over again. There'll be a coupon code in the link in the description if you want these. I think we've probably shot this like, God, it probably seems like we've shot this a couple hundred times already, but great target and a uh, great gun. So we're going to shoot this a little bit more. <laughs> All right. So next in the drills that I'm going to run, I'm going to run the 3R3 because I kind of want to show you the functionality with the reload with this gun. It is actually pretty fast, especially if you're loading from a belt. So if you're the kind of guy who likes to shoot with an AR-15, Coming over to this isn't so bad. It's just the, the spot where you're loading the mag is just a little bit different. Instead of being up here, it's like just a little bit further back, but still pretty quick. So without further ado, let's give it a shot. Go ahead and get my shot timer set up. All right. That was like a 3R3 and like 4.2, so not crazy fast, but still, as you saw, pretty efficient considering completely different gun than an AR-15. Um, even kind of doing your tack reloads isn't so bad with this gun either. Uh, but very, very efficient gun within the bullpup family of guns to run, um, especially at a pretty decent pace too. But uh, so if you're looking at getting a gun that you can kind of make that transition over into bullpup. This is probably one of the more AR-15 friendly bullpups to make that transition to. Agilite's basically been able to bring Israel up to con the contemporary market with their line of gear. Um, this is the K19. They also make the K0, which was also just recently released. It essentially is a, their take on a tube system type plate carrier. And actually, when you look at the American market, you'll see lots of people have these in the United States. Again, another company that has made their stuff available for the American citizen, patriot, and responsible armed person, really. Um, I've kind of mixed it a little bit with some of my Haley Strategic stuff. I got my Haley Strategic gun belt, which I used in the video, uh, and I've got my Haley Strategic TRMP placard with an amp on it, um, just because, like, I was probably one of the last guys to get their gear from Israel. Um, now, I'm pretty sure they're still sending stuff out, but a lot of the stuff, especially in this colorway, went straight to the military because they, cl they cleaned them out. Because um, when you activate that many people, you're just going to need that much gear. Uh, but yeah, the, the K19 has like a zipper admin pouch up here. Um, it has tube entry for donning and doffing and for getting to a casualty. So tubes are pretty cool, and I, I really like that they use those got them on both sides and on the both shoulders. Um, I did notice specifically even more so with the Tavor, shouldering right here was a little bit of a challenge versus me shouldering it with a different uh, play carrier or whatnot, because there's just a lot of um, more material here. But that's just, you know, a, a small gripe, but that's one thing you just kind of work through. And a lot, honestly, a lot of play carriers have material here anyway. So it just depends on the kind of play carrier you're running. They also sent out the Assault Pack, or uh, their Map 3, which is really cool. I actually got to test it, uh, when it before it first came out. And you can run it as a backpack. You can run it as a Assault Pack. It has an expanding portion for a helmet, which is really cool. I currently have it attached to the back. And at the time of this recording, they actually just released the mini version, which is like half the size. If you're into that and you want a smaller assault pack for your plate carrier, it's a group great option. They've also got hangers, different assortments of pouches, GP pouches that they make that are really cool. Um, last but not least, but probably one of the products that I think they make better than most people, 
Their helmet covers are pretty awesome and they make them in a pretty good range of colors for your Ops Course, Team Wendy's, and of course, your MTEX. Uh, they were one of the first companies to really embrace this helmet platform, which is why I kind of built a relationship with them over the last couple of years. Um, great cable management, storage. I mean, they're just really cool helmet covers and stuff. So be sure to check those guys out when it comes to that, if you're looking to kind of upgrade your lid. Last but not least, I got them IDF looking gloves. Um, these are the Mechanics Wear Agilite collaborations that have these signature um, <laughs> fingerless uh, gloves, which is really cool. They're a little on the thicker side, but honestly, like I kind of got used to them breaking them in a little bit, but having been running like some of the thinner Mechanics gloves, uh, I definitely noticed these are definitely more like duty gloves um, for like your standard infantry guys or whatnot, and maybe some of your soft guys as well. But you might be wondering too, which kind of IDF guy would be running this kit? Uh, it'd probably be more like your Shayat at 13 or some of your other Israeli soft units that are running kit more like this because it's more contemporary to what our American soft uh, is running and that's kind of who they're trying to be like, uh, whether it's the UK soft or us. Um, I don't have the helmet shape breaker, which conveniently Agilate also makes, but was kind of out of stock at the time making of this video because that might have been fun to integrate with this, but honestly you don't see a lot of the soft units really running that too much. You still see some infantry units running it, and when it comes to helmets, um, you'll typically see op scores or helmets similar to op scores being run by the IDF. And for their infantry, you'll see a mix of those and things are more equivalent to like RACH. Um, but that's more or less when it comes to gear. I think they've definitely, in the Middle East, definitely one of the more contemporary units because we've just been giving them tons of money and funding them the last couple, last couple decades. So they've definitely caught up in a lot of ways with gear. Um, it's very interesting to see that evolution uh, I mean, between the, just on their infantry kits and, you know, looking at what they're they're using on their rifles. And surprisingly, there are a lot of guys still running M4s over there. Uh, Colt Commandos and, you know, kind of those kind of carry handle guns and stuff like that. You see typically their soft units are not even really running these. Um, there's still some that are, but you still see a lot of M4s uh, or M4 AR type platforms being run with a lot of their tier one units, which is pretty cool. But just to kind of wrap things up, uh, if you want to support these guys, be sure to check out IWY, IWY US, um, and Agilite if you want to check out the gear or check out the guns. Um, just kind of want to leave you with, hey, if you guys are in the gun industry or a uh, enjoyer of real steel firearms, be sure to check out Airsoft. It's great for training. Support those guys because the future of the gun industry. Airsofters, check out Real Steel because there's a lot of training opportunities, a lot of ways to expand your knowledge and get out there and become a contributing member of our society. So be sure to check it out. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys next time.